For anyone who studies Cold War field gear, there's a point where the mythology and the reality collide. The myth says modern sleeping bags are the pinnacle of insulation. The reality? Soldiers, border guards and long-range patrol units spent nights in temperatures that plunge far below what most modern campers ever face. They didn't always carry big down bags. They didn't have $400 ultralight quilts. What they relied on, often with their lives, was a quilted liner, so rugged, so brutally effective, that it kept men alive in the Siberian night, where failure meant frostbite or death. This wasn't luxury gear. This was Cold War engineering, built to function in the dark, in the wind, and in temperatures that froze vehicles solid. This Cold War liner wasn't meant to impress anyone. It was meant to work. Troops guarding railway lines in 30 below zero weather trusted it. Recon soldiers sleeping in dugouts trusted it. And, you know, decades later, those same surplus liners still outperform plenty of sleeping bags sold today. It's really one of those rare pieces of military equipment where simplicity beats innovation and ruggedness just plain beats marketing. That's the gear we're exploring today. Not as a museum piece, but as something with real lessons for anyone who camps, prepares or studies human endurance. The Cold War liner was engineered to withstand temperatures civilians never trained for. While the exact model varied between Soviet, Finnish, Swedish, Polish and East German forces, the principle was the same. The liner was a thick, quilted, densely stitched layer meant to be paired with wool blankets or canvas bedrolls. It wasn't meant to be used alone, yet soldiers often did, and it still kept them alive. The film material was usually cotton wool blend or kapok-like fibres packed tightly enough to trap heat without relying on delicate loft like modern down bags. That meant the insulation didn't collapse when wet or compressed. The design came from generations who understood that field conditions don't respect gear ratings. If you were in a foxhole, a frozen outpost, or confined in a makeshift shelter, your gear needed to survive mud, ice, snow, and being dragged around. This liner could be rolled, tied, packed, or even frozen stiff and still insulate. That resilience is why, you know, many veterans swear that it outperformed far bulkier modern setups. The secret to its performance was really the combination of density, layered stitching and natural fibres. Unlike modern sleeping bags that chase loft, the Cold War liner relied on density. Fibres packed closely together slow heat loss, creating a kind of thermal barrier that honestly performs steadily even when conditions are truly miserable. The stitching, usually in small square patterns, prevented insulation from shifting or creating cold spots. And you know, natural fibres like wool also continued to produce heat when wet, a property synthetics still can't match. Because the liner wasn't encased in fragile nylon, it resisted sparks from fire's abrasion from coarse ground and the sharp edges of shelters or vehicles. Soldiers frequently laid it directly on frozen soil, used it as a cloak around shoulders, or wrapped it around boots to protect toes. 
A sleeping bag can be a single-purpose item. The Cold War liner was a tool. To understand how effective this design was, just imagine taking a modern polyester-bodied sleeping bag, laying it on snow, and then sitting in it while cooking over an open flame. The sparks will, well, melt holes instantly. Now, if you take a Cold War liner, it will simply shrug off the impacts. That difference, honestly, really matters. This liner allowed troops to make shelter out of almost anything you know. One of the reasons this liner gained such a reputation was its versatility in field conditions. Soldiers combined it with wool blankets inside canvas bivy covers to create a layered modular system. In regions like Siberia, the Caucasus and northern Scandinavia, this was absolutely critical because temperatures shifted rapidly. Troops needed a system they could adjust by adding or removing layers, you know, to cope with the varying temperatures they faced. In survival terms, the liner worked as the core insulating layer. The canvas cover provided wind resistance, while the wool blanket added thermal mass. Quite an effective combination, really. Together, they formed a sleeping system that was incredibly resilient. Many units in the Cold War preferred this approach because if one layer was damaged, frozen or soaked, the entire system didn't fail. A rather clever bit of engineering, I'd say. A modern camper can, you know, replicate this approach. Start with a heavy canvas bedroll or bivy shell. Add a wool blanket, then layer a dense quilted liner inside. This three-part structure traps warm air, resists wind, and creates a sleeping environment that performs well, even when condensation or melting frost becomes an issue. It's definitely heavier than an ultralight setup, but if you're winter camping or operating in sub-zero temperatures, reliability really beats weight savings. You can actually apply Cold War insulation principles in practical ways today. If you want Cold War performance, you don't actually need original surplus gear. Many military surplus stores, you know, still carry quilted liners from Sweden, Poland and East Germany. To adapt them for modern use, just fold the liner lengthwise, stitch buttons or toggles along one edge, and, well, create a footbox. This simple process converts the liner into a functional sleeping pod. Pair that with a wool blanket inside a canvas bedroll and honestly, you've recreated a Cold War sleep system that can withstand even the most brutal conditions. So, a practical method in the field is to insulate below the body first. You see, cold ground actually saps heat faster than cold air does. Place pine boughs, brush, or even your backpack under the bedroll for a bit more comfort and warmth. Lay the canvas ground cloth down first, then the blanket, and finally wrap yourself in the liner. This pretty much duplicates the procedure used by long-range Cold War patrols, and it really works. Another useful adaptation, by the way, is wearing the liner as a poncho inside a shelter during those cold mornings. The dense fabric holds body heat extremely well, and honestly, it's far more durable than most modern insulated jackets. 
This liner earned its reputation because it performed in some of the harshest environments troops ever faced. Units stationed along remote borders had to deal with still nights where temperatures dropped faster than expected. Many slept inside partially dug shelters covered with logs or metal sheets. Moisture would condense and freeze. Wool blankets absorb frost. The quilted liner kept working anyway. It didn't rely on air pockets to stay warm. It didn't lose insulation when compressed, and when paired with even a small heat source, such as a candle lantern or improvised stove, it created a warm microclimate inside a shelter where everything else felt frozen. When you read soldiers' accounts, many describe the liner as the one piece of gear they were genuinely grateful for. Tough conditions expose weaknesses quickly. The liner didn't have any. If you found this deep dive valuable, don't forget to subscribe and share. For those of us who love studying the intersection between history and survival, the Cold War liner stands as proof that rugged, layered systems still outperform delicate modern gear in real-world cold. If you want more content like this, practical lessons from the past, grounded in solid historical research, make sure to subscribe, share this guide with fellow enthusiasts, and stay tuned for the next episode on In the Beginning.